Hello viewers, welcome to the second edition of the Marix interview, a very special feature that comes on YouTube every week. This time we are going to be looking at the Indian coastal sector and inland waterways which for one reason or another have been neglected for so long that I would say to bring it back up to where it really deserves to be I think is going to be a huge effort but we have with us today Captain Rakesh Singh and Captain Vikas Vij. Captain Singh is the General Secretary of the Indian Coastal Conference Shipping Association while Captain Vij is the Treasurer. These two gentlemen are today going to give us a perspective on what difficulties the coastal shipping is facing coastal shipping and inland waterways let's not forget them they're two separate but they're clubbed together here they really need to be working together with a very common objectives um, so these two gentlemen are going to throw a lot of light on what is happening and what is the way forward and very importantly they have a message for the shipping minister welcome Captain Singh and Captain Vij. Amal, yes. good morning. Yes. Uh, so, uh, the very first question I want to pose over here is the very contemporary situation with COVID-19. What has been the impact of COVID-19 on the coastal shipping and inland waterways in direct fashion and in an in indirect manner as well? Captain Singh, please. Thank you. Uh, broadly, we would like to very broadly divide coastal shipping into two segments. One segment of coastal shipping is a cargo carrying vessels, and which are many bulk carriers and small container vessels, etc., etc. And the second segment is a service providing vessels like tugs, MSVs, OSVs, dredgers, etc. So uh, I would first take the vessels which been carrying cargo on the coast of India, including inland waterways. Uh, our business is heavily dependent on first mile and last mile connectivity. And uh, if I give you a broadly a costing, the 40% of the cost of carriage of goods uh, through coastal or inland waterway route, uh, the cost is of handling cost, which is the first mile connectivity and second mile connectivity. So in the first two months of complete lockdown, that was um, April and May, those activities were shut down. No trucks movement, nothing was happening no stevedoring activity. So uh, the vessels, wherever they, they just got stuck and remained there. And that's two long months with some of them, with cargo loaded, some ready to load cargo, etc. So we have our own three vessels stuck in Gohan <clears throat> with cargo on board. So that's the first impact that we saw. Then uh, the second one is that, obviously it's a pandemic and uh, everybody, could use this opportunity to invoke force measure clause. A number of vessels have been off hired by invoking this clause. And uh, where they have not been half hired or off hired, they have been pressurized to cut down on the rates. And, uh, you know, we are the part of, uh, we are a very small group of ship owners. We don't have leverage like you know, big giants who could you know, call the shots. And if a big industrial house in India says, no, no, you got to reduce the rate by 10%, do we have a choice? So that's the second part of the COVID impact. Third part is the most visible, which uh, is must, must, must talk about, is about crew on board. You would, in the earlier days when the transport restrictions were in place and people would carry people through only the cars, hiring of one car from Chennai to Mumbai would almost work out to be a daily charter hire of a small truck. It's unaffordable, humongous cost of crew change. Fortunately, first two months, crew on coastal vessels were very cooperative, not making much noise. They stay put on board. But now with opening a one lockdown era, they have started asking for sign off and we need to do that. That's a huge, huge cost. In fact, the single most the biggest operating cost is crew change cost right now. Uh, the last thing which we have not seen, but we will see it once things become normal as they were before COVID, we will have litigation galore. 
will have all kinds of litigation where the vessels have been all fired or where the charters are pressurized in different ways to the owner like something like happened after post monetization demonetization people were not able to honor their contracts and there was a series of litigation and we see that after the covid is over and things become normal we'll see series of litigation so broadly in this four four points i see the impact of covid coastal, on coastal shipping and i'm sure you know other uh, branches of shipping as well thank you thank you sir thank you i yes that, that's that's an excellent answer there uh, what i would like to know next is what are what so what is ixa as an association doing for its members to tide over this very difficult situation Rakesh Singh said, uh, the other uh, additional costs have been, for example, some vessels were due for statutory surveys, so they have been extension surveys. Although DGS has uh, made the process simpler and waived off the administration fee, there is still some cost for the extension of three months. So we are very thankful to DGS for giving us this uh, extension window with an online uh, survey of our vessels. Uh, added to uh, some offers, there is also a delay in charter hire payments. Now you ask me about uh, how ICSA is uh, coordinating with member companies to tide over this phase. Uh, we as an association, we have been engaging and Captain Rakesh Singh being our spokesman and you know the person who is going in video conferencing with and engaging with ministry, Minister of Shipping. Uh, DG shipping almost on daily basis uh, over video conferences and we uh, have supported DGS good offices to issue orders guidelines some waivers during this time so we have at the same time interacted with uh, our members to understand their immediate pain points sometimes during uh, managing committee meetings or one to one with members sometimes the members call us on the telephone and uh, let us know about what they are facing and how to tide over it. So we do have a even a WhatsApp group of Ixa, where all most of our members are, uh, you know, interacting with us. There is a COVID-19 dashboard on DG Shipping, uh, which time to time has been issuing orders, guidelines, and various information waivers. So we we also, you know, for the ease of members on our group, we keep. Uh, uh, posting such new new press releases. So uh, basically, it's an interface between members. We are also equal members. It's just that uh, uh, being on managing committee, we are coordinating uh, these problems. And DGS has been very warm and receptive to taking ideas and thinking it over and helping us during this difficult time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm sure the viewers are finding all this very, very interesting. The Indian Customs has really revamped their entire system. They have now, uh, you know, gone almost paperless and uh, they have been uh, very, very proactive in making sure that all the operations run smoothly without hindrance. Uh, so what has been your experience? What, what are the changes you have seen, sir? I would like to know how has coastal shipping been affected by it positively. 
see basically the the you're saying the customs is about to go paperless in fact they have more or less gone paperless in many many aspects actually there is a e sign chip module uh, which is linked to ice gate so uh, a prudent uh, cargo operator a coastal uh, uh, ship operator who is moving cargo can now uh, put the cargo manifest through this sign chip everything can be downloaded Although it is called IGM and EGM and in coastal vessels, we are going one from one Indian port to another Indian port. But that is just for terminology. It is actually the cargo manifest. So as I was saying, that e sign chip uh, uh, module is very helpful for this cargo manifest uh, and all the cargo related documents to be uploaded on the uh, e governance of uh, customs side, uh, which is through linked to the ice gate actually. So, the although the cargo manifest uh, import and export is not a requirement for coastal vessels, but uh, just like a domestic uh, airline uh, carrier, they have to submit the uh, manifest and should be in the knowledge and on record as to what moved from in the, in their case passengers from one uh, city to another city. Similarly, for coastal vessels, uh, this cargo manifest uploading is possible now paperless through this module of uh, IceGate, and it's a smooth process. Now, coming to uh, uh, there was a complaint earlier that there are uh, storage facilities, uh, separate storage facilities for uh, coastal cargo were not available, but now uh, I have been in touch with a couple of. Um, major agents in India and pan India now uh, temporary segregation is given just like in airports for uh, domestic cargo you know with a ribbon to demarcate a line and if the carrier uh, informs the port through the agents a week in advance or so as early as possible then that area is earmarked and domestic cargo can be uh, put in these segregation facilities you know. Uh, there are a couple of uh, 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 smaller things which were irritating for coastal shipping. Uh, and now um, a lot of those uh, uh, problems have been, have been solved. For example, there was a port clearance required earlier from customs. So Mumbai customs was in the lead and now other ports have followed. So more or less many ports in India are now not insisting for a port clearance which was wasting about half a day. Shipping bills are also being processed faster now, and this is all online model. So I would say there are a lot of improvements. Uh, yes, one more thing. The conversion was taking a lot of time when you are you know, importing a ship and you, you want to use it as a coastal ship. The conversion certificate was a very long process because it, it was all manual and one was running pillar to post, you know. And uh, it was all uh, dependent on the efficiency of your officer involved. Now, almost all documents through the agent can be uploaded on the ICE gate, which is uh, centrally controlled by uh, uh, CBC, Central Board of Excise and Customs. And uh, the interface, uh, the physical interface for uh, uh, you know inspection of ship is just by apprising officer, which is a one hour, two hour visit. Uh, yes, in some cases, if the documentation is not in order, then it becomes a little longer process. So uh, technical upgradation is required from time to time and it has to continually improve, you know. Uh, one more thing uh, is that the, the, there is no incentivization by the uh, deputy commissioners of each uh, port customs where the revenue collection targets are there. The next part I would like to ask you is, how has the director general's office been assisting in these tough times? I would like to add a few lines on the, what director general of shipping has been doing during this COVID era. Uh, That's very important. <clears throat> Though from our side also, we put things in perspective. A, I think very surprise, pleasant surprise, the director general and the industry also learned that we could do the work without actually going to the DG's office, yeah. without footfall. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the responses are faster and better, uh, you know, 
online today. Uh, DG was very kind enough to ensure that all payments uh, to be made to the directorate, apart from Bharat Kosh, like we made provident funds or gratuity, etc. Everything has been made online now. All these years we have been queuing up with the checks and letters that's been done. So we are doing it online now. The directorate is actually working on two fronts. One is a COVID cell for the crew, which is led by Captain Daniel. And we must understand that the directorate has to look for the entire Indian shipping, not only Indian coastal shipping. As also, is, the directorate has to look at the Indian National Employed and Foreign Flag Vessels. They're doing a tremendous job under the circumstances. The responses have been terrific. You could get your job done in half an hour by giving a call to the cell. Uh, as far as coastal shipping is concerned, we were not particularly pleased with the general SOP for the crew change. We thought the conditions were too stringent. And obviously, I don't blame directorate because directorate also, like every other ministry or government office, is evolving as we're learning more and more about COVID, the understanding about COVID is changing by the week. So same way the scenarios are emerging and we have requested directed to make some modifications uh, for uh, to the SOP for coastal shipping where the burden could be reduced for us, and particularly when do the changes in small ports where there are hardly any facilities. So that is one front. Second front directed has been very active and helpful is on technical front as much as possible under the conventions the directorate has been giving exemptions and extensions of all kind. We couldn't have expected more, I think, on that front for directorate. So that's one point. The second point which Vikas was saying, I'll just fill in a few bit on customs point, is that customs going paperless is the great news. The biggest problem for us has been where customs as well as immigration both, I'll club the two issues, where we need to have human interface. We need to involve an intermediary and he has to go and visit the office, carry the, create the shipping bill or pass the shipping bill. I mean, it's a huge, big nuisance. Once it is paperless online, we don't shy away from complying, but just make it simpler. That give us a, even a ship owner or a manager should be able to upload whatever information custom needs or immigration needs and then generate the NOC or certificate, whatever possible. Uh, this is one of the low hanging fruits which were identified earlier in solving coastal shipping problem. I think this will be a great help for us. By far, I think this sums up what Vikas was trying to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. What is your message now to the shipping industry as to the key areas that the shipping ministry should be collaborating with you to take you through and to take coastal shipping and in inland waterways into the next decade? Uh, Honorable Minister uh, uh, G has categorically and repeatedly stated that he wants to see coastal shipping grow, inland waterways grow. And he had made it very emphatically, and he told his uh, officers as well, that he wants to see significant growth of coastal shipping from existing of 6% or so share that we have, and inland waterways will be 1% or so. So his commitment and his policy directives would be, you know, go a long way in what we want to achieve. I would rather like to club this with the future of coastal shipping, you know, what we would request the minister as well as where do I see the coastal shipping to be. Uh, again, uh, there are, there's a long wish list that what we want from the ministry, but I would request uh, honorable minister that the matters who require interministerial coordination, I would request his focus and attention on that because once, it goes beyond the Ministry of Shipping, it becomes impossible for us to do anything. So in that area, I would request Honorable Minister to you know, help us out. For example, the wish, long wish list that we have, I will only uh, go through some key points from that list. One is that we have been seeking to bring inland vessels under tonnage tax scheme. Today, the tonnage tax scheme covers only vessels registered under the MS Act. And this has been our long pending demand that if inland vessels are also brought under tonnage tax, then we'll have a cash flow. There will be more investors who are willing to invest the money in inland vessels uh, or acquisition of vessels. There's one request. We all know the problems that not only shipping and all industries played with the financing. The, the debt servicing is a huge, huge cost. Again, that is something which ministry uh, cannot independently do much about it, but I do hear that there is a, some uh, discussion going on whereby 
either uh, some kind of a fund or a guarantee uh, which a ministry could bring in place and it will be easier for us to get finances maybe with uh, you know the today financing system is such that you go to not only hypothecate the ship but you have got a huge collateral apart from your equity investment so this equity uh, collateral part becomes very difficult for us unlike foreign banks where your good balance sheet and your equity is enough to buy a ship but where it doesn't happen in india so in that regard the ministry is already thinking in that line and uh, so that will be a good help if uh, we could get cheaper quicker finance i have already told you about tennis tax uh, on the regulatory front that's where the ixa has a very uh, very clear mind and this has all gone to the ministry and the concerned offices we think that we need to have a separate body or separate act or a sub act within msx for coastal zone whereby we today as of today the as far as the regulatory front is concerned what we look at is we look at the convention and try and dilute it a little bit and then give it to the coastal zone that is not serving us we need iv plus rules not ms minus rules and that's what we think if you look at the example of japan as very successfully china they have created body called jg german government plus it's a part it's it's only to cater the japanese coastal shipping zxt china only to cater japanese chinese coastal shipping bkk indonesia they have nkk for exim cargo vessel and jg in japan for coastal vessels i think it's time that we need this kind of a body in india we have taken it up with even in i international of shipping and of course the directorate and the ministry that we should start thinking along those lines and the regulatory overload could reduce on the vessel or at least simplified you know as we cause it said earlier that we would comply by comply but make it simpler a and then the last thing of course is the in our wish list is that if the fuel uh, that is being consumed on coastal vessels could be brought under gst again i mean you know it's a it's a wish list as i said and uh, it's not entirely up to the ministry that to do but that's our you know agenda and we have taken that up ministry so i as far as future of coastal shipping is concerned we do have certain let's admit it certain disadvantages peninsular coastline even though it's 7500 kilometers is not very conducive for coastal trade you know we often uh, we don't shy away from saying so but uh, it's not very conducive the uh, it's unlike straight line china has or australia has a you know rounded coast the peninsular line has its disadvantages uh, but nonetheless as i said the share is so minimal of coastal shipping that the only way it can go, go move is go upwards so and along with the inland vessel uh, inland movement of cargo when the synergy is achieved between the two the inland movement as well as coastal i think we should uh, cross the double figure in next couple of years with this necessary support and blessings that i have listed out you know in earlier to you so how 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 do you see the coastal trade of india growing in the next couple of years throw some light on it thank you you see uh, you asked me the next couple of years so Uh, let's say this fiscal year, the the first quarter is already gone, you know, uh, almost gone with the May, June end approaching. Uh, then now we are in the middle of uh, uh, foul weather season, you know, uh, which will last for July, August, September, and practically the whole of October. So we will have about five to six months in this year, where the if post uh, unlocking. things move on and uh, the pace is picked up but uh, in the near short to medium term uh, the first goal will be to revive where coastal shipping was uh, as at pre- as before uh, pre pre covid times but post covid times and you know once uh, uh, the, the virus is decoded india will be in a rush to pick up from where it left you know there are some some drivers of growth for coastal shipping i feel that uh, there has to be a creation of uh, sea logistics cargo movement by the by the sea where especially where it is a linear run let's say from gujarat or maharashtra to down south uh, cochin mangalore and you know 
I mean, you don't have to round Sri Lanka and go on the east coast or something. And similarly, there, is, there are linear runs available on the east coast. Uh, national waterways development is happening at a very slow pace at, at the moment, but it is picking up in a very uh, bright topic these days. So it depends on how fast we can develop our waterways for the river sea mode of uh, transport. And uh, Captain Rakesh Singh is making uh, miraculous uh, strides on the east coast, wherever some openings have come across from the government. Also, our uh, coastal cargo movements also depend on how the exim uh, trade happens based on uh, more export and import of commodities. Some of it is evacuated and supplied to the major ports for export and import from the hinterland by way of trucks, uh, rail and all that. But also uh, it gives a boost to the coastal shipping to take the cargo from the exim port from major ports and uh, bigger minor ports like Adani and all. So uh, for the evacuation and supply, the coastal shipping does the light rage operations, takes it from major ports to smaller ports and from there on interland less. And as uh, earlier touched upon by Captain Rakesh Singh that the module of sea logistics is best when the large, last mile connectivity and first mile connectivity bottlenecks are reduced. So if the, if the port infrastructure is good and customs and immigration and uh, security and all these areas are cooperating and working seamlessly, of course, then the coastal shipping is the cheapest mode of of the coastal ship of you know in one or two legs, ten thousand tons moved by just one single ship. This avoids the congestion on road of. Each truck will have maximum 10 tons loaded, you know, so you will have to move 1000 trucks going through the, you know, same roads where, you know, your private cars, public transport is happening. A lot of pollution, spillage from the trucks. They, 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 there is an intention from um, Ministry of Shipping and particularly the present minister and the present government wants to push the coastal shipping. And the in the long term i think once the uh, our industry is port led and there are more uh, uh, production hubs near the coast then coastal shipping will be the only way the ship owners to produce ships and to to manufacture ships in india the time has to match the world standards the technology has to be equally good and the uh, uh, last thing I will add is that the bank loans have to be available at cheaper costs. Uh, it has to be on long period uh, lease models. So uh, when you are fixing the charter rates, uh, which is the end cost to the customer, you know, running the operation is less and your time charter per day reduces, you know. So uh, if it is the if it is sometimes the seller's credit uh, facilities are used in uh, developed countries where the seller is providing the credit to you, and this is over ten to fifteen years. So if there are uh, strides made in made in these directions, thank you, Captain Vikas Vij, and thank you, Captain Rakesh Singh, for being with us. I'm sure your message will reach the minister's ears, and I'm sure coastal trade and the inland waterways will definitely benefit from our interview here. Thank you viewers for being with us and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye.